That's great. I'm going to let people come in for a minute. Uh, stall for time. A couple of promises. We're going we're gonna to talk about sales, but we're not going to talk about car sales. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. I also promise that I'm going to try to speak very slowly. I'm an American. I do get excited, and I would be happy to speak twice as fast as I am right now, but sometimes for the international audiences, I go a little bit too fast. So I'm going to try to keep my cadence nice and calm. And then Donna Benjamin wanted me to make an Australia joke because we're not really in Australia, but some people think we are. I am not going to do that. No? No. No Australia jokes. Okay, the doors are closed. That means you're trapped in here with me. I, I will give you this other little tidbit. This is uh, 10 years since my first DrupalCon. The first talk I ever gave was at DrupalCon Sunnyvale. It was the last session on the last day in the last time slot. There were about 20 people in the room. However, I got four job offers when it was over. So. I also finished 10 minutes early, so we might finish early. OK, um, we'll just launch into things. I'm Ken Rickard. Um, as I just mentioned, I've been <laughs> coming to DrupalCon for 10 years. This is my 22nd DrupalCon, probably my 12th or 13th session, um, but my first sales session, which is kind of interesting. We'll talk about that a little bit. I'm officially the director of professional services, which at Palantir, uh, which is based in Chicago, Illinois, where I work, uh, means I run the sales, marketing, and consulting operations. It's a little bit strange. Um, we use professional services to distinguish from our production services, who are the people who do you know, all the actual development work and design work. Um, so that's contact information if you ever need it. Uh, and I thought I would start a little bit with my career path. This is a simplified version of my career path. Um, I've been working professionally in the web space since 1998. Um, I actually learned HTML in 1995 <laughs> when I was a graduate student because even in 1995 it was clear that video over the internet was coming. and as a grad student, I was concerned. I was at a, a state university in the United States, um, not a top tier school. And what would stop that university from piping in video lectures from Harvard or Yale or Oxford and then just hiring people to proctor the classes? So it's like, I better get out in front of this, this HTML stuff. Um, the, the L shaped box is where Drupal overlaps with the rest of my career. So. I'm actually a failed academic, then I went into the newspaper business. I'm responsible for introducing Drupal to the newspaper uh, industry in the United States, which is kind of fun. Um, so that webmaster job was at a small newspaper. I was an online director at another newspaper. Then I moved to corporate headquarters um, and became, I had about four jobs in six years. Product manager is the easiest one, and it was at that time that I discovered Drupal. We had been building uh, classified advertising systems. We were actually using our own proprietary scripting language that let web developers write commands to an Oracle backend. <laughs> it, it was funny. It turned into a f pretty full-fledged scripting language. It was written at the exact same time as PHP and for the exact same reasons. That's because the C plus engineers didn't want to write HTML code. And they also didn't trust HTML coders to write against their secure database. So. They had to bridge that gap. Um, and then I left that uh, and joined Palantir as a senior engineer. Uh, also, I'll date myself a little bit. <laughs> In between those two things, I had an interview with Acquia, who's celebrating their 10th anniversary this year, too. Uh, when I interviewed, they had five employees. And uh, I had dinner with Dries and uh, Jay Batson, the, the co-founder. And they said, halfway through dinner, they said, so what job would you do at Acquia? And I said, oh. Sales engineering. How many of you know what sales engineering is, by the way? Well, I'm going to back up and tell you what that is. Uh, but Dries looked at Jay and says, I don't know what that is. And Jay explained it to him. And then they looked at each other. And they, they said in unison, oh, yes, we're not ready for that. So the sales engineering piece is fascinating. Let, let me ask a different question. OK, how many people in this room are salespeople? How many of these people in the room are developers? How many of the people in this room manage salespeople? 
How many people in the room manage developers? So, okay. So there's lots of people who don't know what I'm talking about. And there's some people who will just say, yes, I've heard all this before and that's fine. Um, so a couple of interesting pieces. As a senior engineer, again, my job is delivery. Right? As a team lead, my job is delivery and team coaching and management. Sales engineering is, is <laughs> the dark art in the middle. Sales engineering is the process by which a technical person from your agency explains what you can do, what your product does, um, and makes the connection to the technical people on the other side to prove that you can fulfill the requirements of the project. Sales engineering is a little bit more dominant in traditional software sales. Let's say you were going in to buy a, a CRM system, right? The sales engineer would come in and take your requirements and say, well, this is how we're going to implement that thing, right? So sales engineers are for a lot of people in the Drupal community, in particular myself included, is the bridge between being a developer and be getting into sales. I actually started doing all of Palantir's sales engineering about seven years ago, uh, which means for six and a half years, I wrote all of our technical estimates for all of our projects. Um, and then when a client wanted to say, okay, so we're doing a multi-country, multi -country, multilingual installation, how are we going to do that? And how are we going to you know, be compliant with law X and law Y? That's what sales engineers do, right? They're sort of your heavy hitters. You probably have them on your teams, but you probably don't have an official position for it. You probably just pull someone from the production side in to participate in a conversation or to answer a few questions that then the salespeople go for. So from there, I ended up taking over sales. So everything that I'm going to tell you comes from a very different perspective than most traditional trained salespeople. And I should also point out that I had a great conversation with Iztak, um, who's one of the track chairs, and he's from Slovenia, and he said, we really want to have an American perspective on sales, but please do not sell used cars to these people. Please do not do high pressure sales. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that sort of thing. Um, we're also going to play a game called where, what DrupalCon were these photos taken at? This is fun. Um, what is sales? This is actually a, a gourmet ice cream stand in Paris. This is from 2009. Uh, this is on the uh, Ile Saint Louis, right behind the Cathedral Notre Dame. Um, and this guy is like one of the three finest ice cream makers in all of France. And he doesn't advertise and he doesn't sell anything. He just stands in his window and scoops ice cream. Um, sales is... I mean, it's a fascinating thing, and there are huge books written on it. At its bottom, sales is about meeting the demand of people. When, it's funny, when Iztok was talking to me about that high pressure sales, what we consider high pressure sales is when you work very, very hard to create demand, often panic, right? A uh, great example would be um, if you went to all of the Drupal 6 customers you had in your country and said, oh no, Drupal 6 is no longer secure and stable, we have to fix that problem for you right now, or you're gonna run into the next Panama Papers. Remember the Panama Papers? It's been six months, everyone's forgotten the Panama Papers, right? You're at vulnerability to be hacked, we have to fix this for you. That's, that's a bit of a high pressure sale, right? Because you're creating a demand rather than satisfying a need. So there's a real tension in most sales organizations between what you consider uh, outbound sales and inbound sales. Outbound sales is when you go out to absolute strangers <laughs> and try to convince them that you have something that will make their life better, right? Most traditional advertising is based on outbound sales. Inbound sales is more traditional web marketing where you do, you know, content creation, you do SEO, you do all the things to drive people to your website and interact with you and then hand you their information and ask you to contact them, right? One of the things that I would recommend being a sales manager for a couple of years now is you should figure out in your organization which of those models you use and which one you're good at and which one is sustainable for you. Palantir has been in business for 21 years and sustained itself pretty well for 18 years on nothing but inside sales or inbound sales. So people would come to us and say, hey, we have a problem. And we'd say, oh, we'll love to help you fix that problem. That would be great. The, the problem becomes the market is so crowded and there's so many solutions that 
it's very difficult to get enough work just showing up at the door. So there is an analysis you'll want to do about how am I getting my clients? How am I reaching those clients? How am I retaining those clients? So sales is in, in its essence, then I would say, the art of matching customer need to the services that you can offer. And I, I should also point out, I assume everyone here works for a services firm, not a software firm. Uh, there's some different things if you're selling software, like if you work for Lingotech, they have a different sales model because they're selling a more concrete thing, right? Lingotech is, I think, from a sales perspective, very enviable because they go in with a very, very dedicated value proposition. You're in Switzerland. You need to have everything in four languages. We can make that happen and cost effective, and we can provide the translation support. For a salesperson, that's an easy sell, right? As opposed to the kind of work that most of us service agencies do, which is, oh, you need a website that's going to do what, right? That's a much more complicated piece. So the question that I want to get at, actually, is what are you really selling? And that's why I think making that distinction about agencies versus software packages is important. Again, because Lingotech is selling a very concrete solution. Platform SH, you know, Pantheon, very concrete solutions to very specific problems. But many of us are selling something very different. Like, oh, the museum, the Leopold, I would love to work with the Leopold Museum, for example. We went there the other day. The Leopold Museum, they need a web presence. They need a web presence that's going to attract people to visit the museum. They need a way to encourage people to, to uh, both international visitors and locals to come frequently. Um, they have a whole string of requirements that they might have to tease out with, a, with an agency. So it's a very different sales process, right? It's a bit of a discovery. How many of you, by the way, when you're selling things or when you're organizing projects, do you split the, the introductory discovery phase and the actual production into two parts? We, we like to do that. We don't always get away with it but we would prefer to do it that way. It's very common because on a lot of complex projects, you don't actually know what the client needs. The, the client might think they know what they need, right? But if, if they haven't thought through all the permutations or if they don't have a lot of expertise, they might think, oh, these are the trends, this is what we have to do. And you'd find with a little bit of analysis, particularly content strategy analysis, exactly what they do need. And then you build a budget and a project plan around that. That's a really great way to go about things. Um, I'll also ask this question, what do salespeople actually do? Anyone know where that is? That's Dublin. That is Dublin. That's actually, I think, from Drupal Dev Days, not from DrupalCon last year. Um, salespeople, in some respects, are then a bridge from your organization to the outside, uh, organiza uh, to outside organizations, right? They're the folks who are out there. They're the face of everything that you do. Um, the other question, a lot of you manage salespeople. This is my great question. This is more Paris, by the way. Um, how are you supporting sales success? What are you doing to make sure your team is successful? And I'll, I'll give you this one anecdote. Um, when I was working at a newspaper company, uh, I was a technical person, right? I, I had some minor sales responsibility for the internet side. Uh, and we had a sales team of about 12 people. And I went into one of their sales meetings at, nine o'clock in the morning and the sales manager spent about 20 minutes giving out fake prizes and candy and they sang a song and everyone was having a great rollicking time and when it was over I was very very confused and I went up to the sales manager and I said what did I just watch why did you just waste a half an hour of working time singing songs and playing silly games and she said because these people all do outbound sales. They're gonna go out to strangers all day long and nine out of 10 people are going to say no and three out of those 10 people are going to be hostile about it. And if I don't pump them up and get them excited and make them feel good, they're all gonna quit. Fortunately, I, you know, you, that's something you should pay attention to when, again, you're managing your salespeople. How are they responding to it, right? Are they up to the challenge? Because sales is very, the word I like to use is fancy. It's Sisyphean, 
right? Let's roll that boulder up the hill. And it goes down. I'll give you, I don't like to talk about numbers, but I'll tell you this. Over the previous 12 months, we actually exceeded our sales quota by 35%. Wow, great, huh? Yeah, and I'm facing a shortfall in the fourth quarter. How the hell is that possible, right? The, the answer is because a lot of those contracts have to be done be, by the end of the third quarter. And so I'm cramming a bunch of work into a short period, and now I have to go get more work. It's exhausting. And so you do need to put some structures in place to support what your people are doing. Um, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about that, however. But I, I, there's a whole session to be done, just like Joe's session this morning about how to encourage community contributions. There's a great session to be had about just this topic. I am not the right person to do it. This is very alien to me. I'm not a big rah-rah, you'll do great tomorrow person. That's just not in my nature. So let's get to the real bottom of things. What are people actually buying from you? Right? There are a lot of classic statements about this too. Um, people are buying outcomes. This is the first thing you have to remember. It's the first thing you have to train your salespeople on. Right? And the rest of your team. <laughs> They're not buying fancy JavaScript. They're not buying Drupal. They're buying an outcome. And the most important thing, the reason why that discovery phase up front is very important is because that's where you help define the outcome, right? And I'm going to tell you, when we talk about training clients to succeed, you start to define those outcomes during the sales process. This is what you want to start talking about as quickly as you possibly can, right? Um, ooh, look, some outcomes. These are fun ones. Projects we actually completed. This is, this is one of the great ways to do sales, right? We, uh, Mass.gov just finished up. That's the, the state of Massachusetts. It's the entire government. It's a, that project took us uh, 14 months. They'd been working on it for 12 months prior to us joining. They're going to be working on it for the next three years. Cleveland Clinic is a fascinating example. I'll just brag about it for a minute. They didn't even build it in Drupal. We just did the strategy and design work for them. But Cleveland Clinic is one of the three finest hospitals in the entire world. Um, and they are the gold standard for uh, healthcare marketing in the United States. Uh, there's a giant healthcare internet conference in the US every year. And the guy at Cleveland Clinic won induction into their, hall of, their marketing hall of fame last year. And so people do actually call us about that. They call us to do design work because we're the people who designed that even though they build it in Sitecore, which is a Microsoft technology. Eh. Um, but these are outcomes. These are things that you can point to, right? This is actually your, probably your best sales tool in most cases, right? Hey, look what we've done for other people who are like you, and I'll get back to that in a bit. Um, the other big point is clients trust people who can deliver. Um, I like this little slide. This is part of our team. Some of you met George. George was here. George DeMet, who's the founder and CEO. Um, but that's Cynthia Philpott. I've worked with Cynthia on and off for 20 years. Uh, she's one of our project managers. And Kelsey Bentham, who's one of our engineers. Nate Streetinger, who's one of our front-end developers. Um, these are the people who, you know, they work with. And when I promised Iztalk I wouldn't give the car salesman pitch, one very common sales strategy <laughs> that I've used and works fairly well is the, the, the pitch to trust, the pitch to confidence, right? Um, where you're saying, look, we have the experience, we have the understanding, you can trust us to get things done. And it goes a little bit further, too, because we do a lot of agile process, we do a lot of work in the open, we do a lot of collaboration. And one of the things we like to say also is you can trust us to tell you the truth, right? One of the sales techniques that I will use sometimes is to say, look, something is going to go horribly wrong on this project. It's going to happen. It always happens. There's nothing anyone can do to prevent that. The question is, how do we respond when something goes horribly wrong? Do I tell you the truth? Do I tell you about it and we work together to fix it? Do I try to hide it from you? Right? And again, for services firms, a lot of what you're trying to do is match the right clients with the right work and the way you want to work. Right? Like, we don't do 24-7 support. We don't work weekends. We don't work overtime to get things done because we understand that eight hours in front of a computer is draining and you're not going to get people's best work. So we have those kinds of conversations, right? And we talk about the people and how they're going to integrate. 
how your people are going to integrate is especially true if you're dealing with multinational teams. Right? Our support team is actually based in Budapest, and our, that's because we only have enough support work for one full-time employee, and it's impossible to hire one full-time employee with all of the skills you need to do support. So our friends in Budapest give us four people, and we use pieces of them. And it's great. It works out really, really well. But we have to talk about that transparently as part of our process. Um, I threw this in for, for his, his talk as well. Like, where does Drupal fit into the whole thing? Um, otherwise, I wasn't going to talk about Drupal at all, uh, because the answer is um, it fits in when it's valuable to the client's goals. Um, we were very successful for a number of years because we were considered one of the top Drupal firms, and Drupal was a hot thing. And so people would come to us and say, oh, we need Drupal done. Uh, yeah, that was eight years ago, and the market has changed drastically in that time. I mean, Acquia wasn't around. FFW wasn't around, right? If you've ever tried to sell against FFW, it's painful. They're huge. They're aggressive. They're successful. Um, I don't know about in Europe, but we can't sell to anyone who's never talked to Acquia before. Acquia's sales team is three times larger than my entire team. Everyone in the United States has talked to Acquia. Right? So um, people have heard about Drupal, but it's no longer um, a differentiator, differentiator a little bit. If you saw Dries' keynote on Tuesday, he's even talked about that some. When he talks about the proliferation of Node.js and some other technologies, right? when he starts talking about marketing more than technology, it becomes really, really interesting. And the, the shift, I mean, especially in selling Drupal that we've seen is, you know, eight, ten years ago, we were selling to technical people. We don't sell to technical people anymore. We sell to marketing people now. Because it's interesting, the tools have gotten sophisticated enough that you generally don't need technical people to do most of the day-to-day -day work, right? Which means marketing, pe marketing teams own the stack end-to-end. -end. Yeah, and that's just, like I say, a really fascinating change. So Drupal matters sometimes. Right? If you're dealing with government agencies where open data is a big deal, right? Hooray, Australia, right? Drupal's a huge selling point, right? But the average industry, right? We were across the street last night from Unilever, Austria headquarters. Unilever doesn't care about open source. They might care about saving a little bit of money, uh, but Drupal is not a, a selling point for them. They're trying to get jobs done. So. It was a big lesson. <laughs> uh, I had one person who I know, he was polite, he showed up, he said, oh, you're talking about sales, and he left. And I said, well, before you leave, take this away. Here's the big thing. Um, when we talk about leveling up your sales team, and, and like I said, teaching clients to succeed, um, it's your sales pitch sets the tone and the expectations for what a client thinks about as success. Right? It's critically important to get out in front of that. And my follow to that is, why do some projects fail? This is not a DrupalCon picture. This is, a, we did, a, we did a, a charity team building exercise where we went to a school and helped them clean up their grounds and all. But they had a building that was totally disused and falling into disrepair. Um, you know, why do some projects fail? Some projects fail because people on them don't know what success looks like. Sometimes projects fail because people don't have a long-term plan for that success. Um, one of the things we keep finding when we talk to clients um, is that no one has any idea what they're going to be doing in January of 2019. You should. <laughs> if you're investing in Drupal 8 or a new website right now, you should have a plan for what you're doing in, eight, in 16 months, 18 months. Um, and people don't because they're incapable of, in many cases, they don't have the time or the, the inclination, I would say, to think that far ahead, right? It's not something that in part of the culture. So projects fail for a number of reasons, and it's important, I think, to be able to review those with potential clients. Um, and this goes to a lot of, I don't know if you, any of you went to the Being Human track, um, but it was in Joe's talk today too, but in the Being Human track, they talk a lot about um, open communication um, and understanding where people are coming from. It's important and can be very helpful in the sales process uh, to find out what are the consequences for the person you're talking to if the project goes badly, right? 
Um, we've done projects, of course, where if it if the project you know goes over budget or over schedule, there's a huge financial penalty. We did a, a big publishing company a l number of years ago, and if we hadn't hit their deadline, it would have cost them a quarter million dollars, which isn't a giant sum of money, but it's a significant sum of money. Um, so understanding you know where can things go wrong and. In the sales cycle, if someone is willing to talk to you about this, you're in, <laughs> right? If they're willing to be this honest and vulnerable with you, you have established the trust, right? And you have done your job. So it's okay to talk about failure, right? It's important to talk about success, but it's also okay to talk about failure. And again, success starts at that sales point where you outline for folks, what is that, what are we actually doing? And how are we gonna know that we're done? So this is where I get into the sort of meat of things. As I watch the time. We're good on time, it's not even 11.15 yet. We do go to 11.45, right? I like to get people out on time. Right? Actually, I like to finish early. So, um, it's important, I think, and very beneficial. Again, if you run, say, the production team, it's important to outline for your sales team, how do you do things? How do you want to communicate things? How do you manage risk? Things like that, um, so they can talk about it. So I put together like a sample deck. We do a lot of what we call pitch decks that are really just introductory conversations to help people understand what it's like to work for us, uh, with us, excuse me. Um, and to set some expectations about what, how the project's going to unfold. So uh, these next few slides are a, in a very abbreviated version of what I promised, I think, in the introduction, which is here's some tools that you can use either externally or internally to train up your sales team and train up your clients. What's interesting about this, this little next couple of slides I'll show you, frequently what we find in the sales process it's a, one of your biggest problems. It's another session entirely. You will often find that you're selling to the wrong level of the organization. I don't know if that happens as frequently in Europe, but if you meet someone here at a DrupalCon, they might be in charge of web development and have no budget authority whatsoever, right? And they really like you and they want to work with you, but they can't, and someone is nodding aggressively over here, right? But they can't green light the project. So what you end up doing is, either trying really hard to get in front of the right person or more commonly pitching to that person and then giving them material so they can make the internal sale because the internal, like the, C, the chief marketing officer doesn't want to be bothered talking to vendors, right? This is a very common problem. So this is one of the ways that we get around that is by putting together these kinds of presentations, say, look, here's how we're going to solve your problems. And yes, you're free to use this internally to, to sell the project, and if there's anything you need us to do to help, we're happy to. Um, and that works decently well. Um, but it's something to, to watch for. So my other sort of professional sales advice, be very aware of what level of the organization you're selling to. And if you, if you have a sophisticated sales organization, you generally have people whose part of their job is to figure out who you're talking to and why you're talking to them. Right? And the, the trick is to get to the decision maker as quickly as you possibly can. So we like this, yeah, we help you succeed. Well, okay, how do we do that? Hey, this is a small project. We're gonna focus on four things. We're gonna focus on your strategy, your user experience design, uh, your front end development, your back end development. Very simple project. We might be building a, excuse me, uh, we're building a single page, we, we actually did this project. Single page websites to promote museum exhibitions. And what we actually built them was in Drupal 8, we built them a, uh, a single page application builder powered by Drupal 8 and the paragraphs module. So they have all these cool little components that they can create these, you know, interactive uh, experiences that promote certain events at their museum. Great, four part project. We're gonna talk about strategy. What do you want people to do? We're gonna talk about how we design the user experience. Then we're gonna do the front end piece, then we're gonna do the, the back end piece, and then you'll be done. There's some other stuff that we're skipping in this case. Um, generally, when we talk about things, and I have a longer talk about just this, we usually talk about all eight of these things, 
right? Your strategy, your user experience design, front end and back end development. Deployment, which people often forget to plan for, oddly enough. Training, we do a lot of training because it's very rare that our clients want us to maintain their site long term. They want to do it, they have to do it. Uh, we talk about project management, we talk about uh, support. I think it's, again, one takeaway. <clears throat> If you want like practical things to go do, write yourself a list of the things that you think are important that every client does. And that's what you start selling to, right? So when I talk about training clients for success, this is one of the things we talk about. It's like, okay, what's your long-term plan for support? Right? How are you doing deployments? How are you doing updates, right? Do you, do you roll out new features every two weeks? What's your QA process, right? What's your testing process? process. So there are lots of ways to break all of these things down because all of these items all break down into smaller pieces as well. So when we start walking through things, say, okay, okay, let's talk about the strategy part of the project. We're going to frame those goals. You know, there's some technical strategy, right? The technical strategy is the part I like because I used to work in a newsroom and so I like to talk about editorial workflows and how many people do you have who can create content. We were doing a project recently with a, a university publishing house, and they wanted to have um, custom landing pages for many, many events. They wanted to be able to spin up these elaborate landing pages. And the question came down to, okay, well, who has time to create that content? And no one raised their hand, and so that idea got scrapped. I mean, they wanted to pour a ton of resources and development time into building this really cool thing that they couldn't actually use because they didn't have enough staff for it. Um, that's a hugely important thing to, to talk to people about. Um, yeah, we do user research, right? Understanding how people are doing things. And that, that classic, understanding who your audiences are. It's really important to focus on your highest priority audience. Right? Because that's going to help you prioritize your features, it's going to help you prioritize your budget. So all of these things come up. You know, what are your analytics? How are you actually measuring and tracking success? Again, I'm going to say this like six times. There was one thing that's really important you tra train your clients to do. It's define their success criteria. The term that we use in the U.S., I don't know if it's over here, is um, KPIs, Key Performance Indicators. Uh, KPIs can be things like um, how many page views did we get? How many um, requests for proposal submissions did we get through our forms? Um, in the case of the sales team, our KPIs are, what's our gross revenue for the year, right? That's a KPI. What's important about KPIs is they are measurable, they are trackable, and they are reportable. We put our sales KPIs on a dashboard that's visible to the entire company, right? So anyone can come in at any time and see how we're doing based on our metrics. Right? So if you have someone whose job is on the line, if they you know, don't deliver a successful project, the nicest thing you can do for them is help them define KPIs and figure out how they're going to report them back to their management. Right? Because then they can take control of the narrative of success. Does that make sense? Right? Hey, how are we going to know that this project for the Leopold Museum was successful? Well, we would like our Austrian uh, visitor count to rise 10% over the next six months. That's measurable, right? We'd like our um, you know, yearly annual membership to rise 5% over the next year. Perfectly measurable. These are KPIs, um, and you get people to sign off on them. Right. They also let you, of course, have like signposts on the way so you could say, hey, it's six months in and we were expecting a 5% increase. We were hoping for a 5% increase. We've only got two so far. Maybe we should increase our advertising budget. Right? It lets you plan for things. So walking through these kinds of things with clients, right? again, as part of the sales process, to expose them to things that they're not thinking of. Because remember, I'm, I'm making the assumption that you're all dead-on professionals and you do this all the time. Our average client works on a web project once every five years, right? They're not exposed to these things all the time. So it's our job to help educate them and say, look, this is what's really, really important. Um, yeah, user experience design. These are the fun parts, right? Uh, user journey mapping Unit is a fancy word for saying, what do we want people to do? Right. We want people to come, browse our events, click and buy a ticket. Great. How do we optimize that so it's really easy to do? 
Uh, you know, what's your information architecture? How does that happen? What's your content strategy? What's your multilingual strategy? These are all user experience questions. And this is also where we do usability and accessibility testing. Right? By the way, again, American, I don't know what the situation is in Europe, but if you want to do high pressure sales, if you want to just go start cold calling people, accessibility. Especially if they're taking, in the United States, if they're taking government money, they have to be accessible. There was a grocery store chain that just got hit with a, an accessibility fine because the grocery store was considered to be an essential service and therefore subject to the Americans with Disability Act. And I apologize for not doing my research and knowing if there's similar things here in the EU. And then, yeah, front end development. What do we do here? Uh, the big thing we talk about, again, along with accessibility, is responsive design. And dear Lord, we're not designing things in Photoshop anymore. <laughs> we don't do static comps. Um, if you're ever working with a designer who wants to give you static comps, you should fire them immediately. Or if you're feeling like Joe and polite, you should train them on how not to do that anymore. You should be doing component-based design. You should be doing living style guides that can be used over and over again. This is a big deal because doing a design system is actually kind of hard and it takes a lot of time and it's hugely valuable. Um, and that sort of gets to the heart of what you're doing at this point in the sales process, which is you are estab establishing value for the service that you provide, right? So walking through this, thing, you know, the worst project we did in the last three years was where someone else did the design and they gave us 152 Photoshop files. And they didn't use responsive design. They used adaptive design, which meant that they wanted the layouts to be different on mobile than on desktop because things, we threw them away. And it set the project back six months, and the client was furious. And we had no choice. Um, yeah, back-end development, we can walk through this. So this is the type of thing that we get into. And this is usually like our second sales conversation. Our, our, usually our first sales conversation is a get to know you, who are you, what's your role in the organization, what are your goals, what's your timeline, do you have an actual budget, right? We throw a lot of projects away at that point. Um, that's okay, right? Um, because if they don't have a timeline, a budget, uh, a timeline, a budget, and a feature list, or at least a, an inkling of what they want to accomplish, there's no there there. There's nothing to do. Um, so. This is usually our second conversation where we say, okay, here's how we're gonna solve your problems. Here's how we're gonna define them. Here's how we're gonna attack them. Um, and my advice here is I sort of go back from the, here's my fake presentation back to the real presentation. You're selling confidence through experience as a general rule, right? Uh, again, if you don't wanna do used car or high pressure sales, what you want to be able to do is walk into the Leopold Museum and say, you know, we just did this exact same thing for the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. Let, let me show it to you. Let's talk about how we solved their problems. Let's talk about how we took their digital assets, we took their audio tours, and we took their photo catalog, and we took the art they were using for their brochures, and we used it to build these multimedia experiences. That's what gets people excited. This is the easy path to sales, really, to go and say, look, we've done this before. Right? Here's some examples. Um, you, of course, want to emphasize what sets you apart from other firms. And the irony here of using a code thing is, this is the, the difficulty in Drupal right now. Um, again, I presume you see this pressure in Europe. My experience is a little different, um, largely because in the US, there's a lot of offshoring to European firms, particularly in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, why would people hire us when you can hire a Ukrainian firm for a quarter of the cost? who have the exact same level of technical skill. That's a huge problem for us, right? Um, like I said, I mean, we had to outsource our support operation to Hungary because we can't afford to keep enough people to do all the work that has to be done because you can't find all that. We can only afford one full-time employee for that. So that's a huge problem. And the reason we're seeing a lot of pressure in the United States because there's there's pressure from two sides in, in the market. And I mentioned like FFW and some of the things that Acqui is doing. So number one, there's a huge explosion in the market, right? You have very nice companies like Srian, uh, Srian who's here, who has a huge staff of Indian developers who are much less expensive than we are and 
very technically competent and have a great track record. And so I can't sell against them on the basis of how good our code is. It doesn't work that way, right? And at the same time, we have really, really big firms who are either advertising agencies or famous design firms coming in from the high end of the market and saying, hey, Leopold Museum, you should work with us. We designed the Guggenheim and we designed the, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you have to find very, very quickly what makes you stand out, right? And it, it could be, there's someone in the audience I know, it could be that you're the best Nordic newspaper website solution in the entire industry, right? Great, that's a thing. As long as you know that market's big enough to sustain you, but that's another question for another day. Um, another piece of advice, show expertise in project risk management. I have another talk that I do, the two-minute guide to everything you need to know about risk management. The 30-second version is write down everything that can go wrong, how you're going to make sure it doesn't go wrong, who's going to be responsible for making sure it doesn't go wrong, and what you're going to do if it does go wrong. That's it. That's risk mitigation 101. But it's, it's hugely important, again, because the people you're dealing with, again, these are big, important, expensive projects for most of them. And they don't know what could go wrong, and they especially don't know how to respond when something goes wrong. Um, and then, yeah, connect your past projects to client needs. We use this one a lot. This is World Business Chicago, which is really just a promotional vehicle for the city of Chicago to encourage businesses to come and do business there, right? And this opens tons of doors for us because it's really just pure marketing and it's got support from the mayor and all this other stuff. So people in Chicago really love this, so we use this all the time. But um, there's a guy who's got a great job. There's a, a guy named Andre Hood. Andre works for Phase 2, big uh, U.S.-based uh, troop reform. Andre's entire job is to open new markets based on their past work. <laughs> right? And he's good at it. He's really good at it. So he'll say, oh, yeah, we've done museum websites before. You know what's similar to museum websites? Uh, libraries. Yeah, and then he'll go sell a bunch of libraries based on what they've done in, in museums. Um, we've used this very effectively as well. Um, our bread and butter clients used to be universities. Then we started doing some university med schools, and now we're doing a lot of hospitals. Right. It's just sort of this natural progression. You have to be able to crack those doors open by making connections, by saying, hey, this problem space that you're dealing with, this looks and sounds familiar to me. Here's how we've solved that for other people. Check time. OK, we're in. 15 minutes left. I want to save time for questions. I'm almost done. Uh, more sales thing. Emphasize long-term benefits. This is uh, the tulip fields in Holland. These are great. These have been here for hundreds of years. I love that photo. Uh, but long-term benefits of what you're doing. This is actually one of the places where selling Drupal actually will benefit you because of the total cost of ownership since there are no licensing fees, right? And the pace of innovation, right? There's a there's a company in the U.S. that we're, we're going after right now because they sell to universities and they just went from being a software that you buy and install on your own servers to being a software as a service platform, which has made a lot of their customers very angry. They're also very slow to develop new features. And so we're just targeting every single one of their clients. We've already worked with three of them. Um, and we're actually teaming up with Acquia to go after the other 25, right? Um, and we're going to go after, here's the long-term benefit of switching to an open source platform, right? It's going to be a very successful campaign, I suspect. Um, this one's important, too. <laughs> Build trust through mutual commitment. Um, when I was talking about, like, you, you want to get to what, what does failure look like? What are the consequences of failure? Um, some of the most successful, not just sales conversations, but professional conversations I've ever had with people are like, look, if this project goes sideways, what, what does that mean? I was talking to one university administrator, and her project, literally halfway through, her team had tried to build the project, um, and they had failed, essentially. We came in and were like, look, you're going to need to spend another 80% of your budget for us to come in and fix all this. Right? She was not happy. Um, and, and we were talking about it, and she said, yeah, the, the new president of the university just did a Drupal implementation at his old state university 50 miles away. If I can't do this, I'm going to look 
stupid and incompetent, and I'm going to lose. She did not actually say she was going to lose her job, but clearly she was going to lose her job. And I had to say, look, I understand this is a huge budget commitment. I understand this is not how we want, want it to go. But if we do this, I can guarantee that you'll be able to go to the president and say, here's what we did, here's how we did it, here's going to be the long-term benefit for it. That's huge. Now, I don't have the same kind of, my, my neck's not on the line the way hers was, but if you can make that connection, that people understand, you know what is important to them, that's hugely important. Um, you want to guide the client to the right outcomes. This is from our old office. If you can't read that, it says, you have never experienced Shakespeare until you read him in the original Klingon. It's a, it's a wharf quote from Star Trek. It's on our wall. Um, but we do a lot of this. Right? And this is where, I, 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 again, teaching clients to succeed. Take that mindset when you start those initial conversations. Get them thinking in the right way right, so that they can get to where they need to go. Um, and explore how you're going to work together. This is, I think, also really critical for international teams. Um, we did a project recently where our team was in Chicago and Cincinnati, another small U.S. city in the Midwest. Um, their developer was a Russian guy living in New York City. They had another developer who was half-time in North Carolina. Their project manager was in Abu Dhabi, I think. Um, and that created some interesting problems. Uh, so you want to, when you're talking to people about how your project's going to go, talk about like what tools do you use? How do you communicate? Right, these are important. Like we use GitHub for these things. We use Jira, which I hate, but the team likes. Um, we use Google Hangouts all the time. You know, like, how many of you are remote companies? How many of you like do your work not together? Right? How many of you work it? <laughs> separate from your client's workspace, right? Like, you don't go to your client's office every day, right? So they're always going to have that question. Well, how do we collaborate if we're not meeting face-to-face -face every day? Oh, we Google Hangouts. We have a 15-minute meeting every morning, right? It's a standing invitation. We have a Slack channel. We have those sorts of things. Um, these all build trust by building openness and confidence in the communication tools. Um, yeah, we have tons of them. So my last piece here, when, when to talk about, you notice I haven't talked about money directly tied to sales yet. Um, it's because, again, sales uh, 101, the first person to mention money loses. That's in a negotiation, right? So um, you discuss the cost after you establish the value of the thing, right? So you walk them through, hey, these are the eight things you have to do to be successful with this project. Here's what your plan's going to look like six months from now. Here's how you're going to measure success. Here's what we're going to do 18 months from now. And they should, by that point, be excited. They should be anxious and ready to work with you. you know? And then you're like, okay, well, let's talk about how that costs break down. Typically, here's where I use real numbers. But sometimes in these preliminary conversations, I like to just give these percentages, which I can freely share. And these may differ from project to project, but for most of our end-to-end -end development projects, this is about right, right? We want to spend about 20% of our time on strategy. We want to spend a significant part of time on content strategy, right? We want to spend some time on design, usability, all these things. And then this last one, this, uh, you know, project management and support, this, hey, you have this overhead too, right? And having this frame is really, really helpful, right? Because this is not how people are thinking about things typically. Uh, the worst case, actually, in many, in many uh, I, I will say, the worst sales cost conversations that I have are for people who think they're buying a piece of software, right? Like, oh, yeah, I have Photoshop. It costs me $200 a year for a license, and it does these 18 things. Yeah, that's not how web development works, right? So uh, key and important. So, my, my recap slide, uh, sell to your strengths, as I said a couple of times, from not selling used cars. You want to define your value proposition, right? establish your distinct message, sell to outcomes, always sell to outcomes, um, ground your pitch in your actual experience. Right? Um, I actually got into the sales piece because I had newspaper experience and we were selling to media companies, and so I was like the expert. Right? That's how I got into it. I actually helped 
helped someone close a deal at Drupalcon Seged that I had nothing to do with. They just wanted a bunch of editors from a Swedish newspaper wanted to hear from someone who was an expert in the field. And since I knew like what computer to plate was, it's a printing process, um, they trusted me. Right? The way they didn't trust the engineers that they were talking to at the software company. So, um, yeah, anticipate and solve problems. And then, yeah, sell the value of doing it right. This is actually, as we speak as a Drupal community where, where everyone's success makes everyone else successful, please don't, don't like undercut on price. We, had a, we lost a client. <laughs> we lost a client. They were on Drupal 6, needed to go to Drupal 8. And I think our estimate for the project was something like $75,000. And the man was outraged. He's like, yes, but these people in Moldova can do it for 20. And I'm like, have a nice life. Enjoy, right? Because they don't know anything about your business. They don't care about your business. They're just churning through at the lowest possible price they can. You know, um, you're not going to get the same level of service. And if you don't care about that, then I don't care about you. Uh, again, if you were in uh, Angie Byron and um, Shannon Vettis, and there was a third woman who I don't know, Jen, did a talk yesterday about um, conflict resolution in the community. And they had four quadrants, and it, it was uh, the high value people, uh, high value people. Uh, and nice people, basically. And if you were in the nice and, and high skill, we would do everything we could for you. And if you were in the mean and low skill, we'd be like, goodbye. And so this client was mean and low skilled. And so we happy to part ways with them. Um, so yeah, again, to recap, that's who I am. Uh, that's how you reach me. We have eight minutes for questions. Uh, I am supposed to also tell you there's a contrib contribution sprint tomorrow, right? Um, <laughs> By the way, for those of you who are not developers, one of the things the Drupal project really needs are like product managers and project managers and people can help organize work and define requirements and help people understand how to test things. Uh, so if you've never, and, and documentation, oh good lord, we need documentation. We need marketing help too, actually. So if you're interested in such things, come to the sprints tomorrow. People will be happy to point you in the right direction. I'm also supposed to tell you that you can get this session on the, uh, website. Uh, the recordings, based on the rest of the week, the recordings will be up by midnight tonight. So if you like this session, go and leave a few comments. If you, you can recommend it to, to colleagues. And like I said, I will open things to questions, uh, but I'll go back if you want contact information. Thank you. You said you weren't going to heckle me, Donna. Okay. There's an actual microphone too. And it's okay if you want to leave, I won't be offended. You talked about George. His name's not George, I'm just making fun. You talked about uh, the in, in, uh, selling to the right person in an organization. Yeah. And helping people do the internal sales up if, if you haven't got to that person. What about when you're, you might be talking to the right person, but there are other people who are doing the anti-sales job, perhaps the, I, perhaps you're talking to the marketing people and your IT team are actually going, no, hell, we want to use Sitecore. Right. This is a common problem. Everyone heard and understood the question. Um, the common problem of, right, so maybe you're talking to the right people, maybe they really want to work with you, but other people in the organization are kind of sabotaging things. And this does happen. Um, Really, in, I'm going to call it professional sales organization, this is something that a position called the business development rep really digs into. The, the BDRs are the people who are sort of doing the hunting and gathering for the salespeople, so the salespeople can focus on the, the big, important sales conversations. And so, number one, you want to understand you know, who you're talking to. Part of the, the script we actually have for our BDR, excuse me, is to, to ask you know, who else in the organization makes decisions about how you do things on the web. Um, and, I, and I'll give you two interesting examples. There was one hospital system we really wanted to work with, and they would have liked to work with us, but they were a totally Microsoft IT department. And normally we would just let it pass. We actually got, a, we got an email yesterday from a, an auto manufacturer who desperately needed developers. And one of our solutions architects looked at it and said, yeah, you're Microsoft stack. You're invested in these things. We really can't help you unless you're willing to do these other things. Um, so that's a huge problem. In that hospital case, um, 
we actually gave them the hard sell. I put together like an 85 page presentation about why they should be using open source. The, the problem boiled down to they wanted to host everything internally and they were IIS, Microsoft all the way to the ceiling and there was no way we were getting in there. I'll give you the worst example. We had a big project that we were doing, biggest sale I ever made. And the, I, the director of IT basically didn't care. Um, it, the marketing team was running it. He's like, I'm not gonna block it, but I'm not gonna support it. Um, and then the person who was championing the project, who was the chancellor of the university, retired. And then two weeks later, they hired a new marketing director and the marketing director immediately killed the project. The $2.2 million project, that, <sighs> I was not real, yeah. So that's, hey, with the exchange rate right now, that's like a 1.8 million euro project, yay. Giant hole in my budget, great, thanks. Uh, and that, that was actually because we didn't create the right alliances within that big organization. I mean, there's a whole dynamic to, again, when you're dealing with large organizations, understanding who are the players. Um, one of our uni successful university clients, um, they actually told us very, very clearly, it's like, okay, we're over here, we're responsible for these things in the marketing department, but the PR department has their own concerns and they're hostile to us in many cases. <laughs> And so they, they were like, we need you to come and give a presentation to an open house to the entire university where they can ask you questions about things. I mean, this does happen. Um, the, the highest pressure sales pitch I ever had to do I was coming back from DrupalCon, or uh, Dev Days in Dublin. And I had to, instead of flying home, I had to fly to Minneapolis to meet with the University of Minnesota who had an open house and committee meeting that had half as many, there were like 40 people in the room. And so I'm jet lagged on having just got off a 15 hour flight and I have to give a two hour presentation to anyone who might show up from the university community to talk about why we'd be a successful partner on the project. Yes. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering how do you re respond to clients that ask you to give a, like a design presentation to make the officials of the homepage already to convince them that you have design cap capabilities or whatever uh, work which you usually would do like in Sprint Zero. So how, how do you, how do you re re reply there, to... Uh, let, let me see if I understand your question correctly. You're asking for people who want to see the design pitches before they sign a contract? Yes. We say no. Good. <laughs> uh, again, I don't know how it's done in Europe. In the United States, the... what is it called? Association of International Graphic Artists have declared that doing design work up front without pay is called work on spec, right? speculative work. Um, and the AIGA has declared that to be unethical. And so we actually just had a case for this where we had a client who were like, we really want to hire you, but we, we want to see how you would design this one thing. We forced them to sign a $3,000 contract mm -hmm. to do that work. And we had this conversation with them like, look, we. I can't. Um, so the, the problem in a sales, co it, it's interesting. In a group like this, it's easy for me to say, that's unethical, we won't do it. That's very difficult to say to a client. Um, and the AIGA, actually, if you Google um, AIGA spec work, and there's a, there's a website, I can't remember the name of it, it's like nospec.com or .org or something like that. Um, they actually have language that you can use. And the AIGA language is essentially, you're asking us to do work that requires a heavy investment in research into your company, help understand the strategy of what you're trying to accomplish. There's no way we can actually give you what you want within the time period you're asking for. And so it wouldn't be an accurate representation of what we would bring to the project. That's basically the way they, they couch it. But then some, with this other client, I actually use the word spec First with the people we were talking to, it's funny, because then their, their chief marketing officer called us the next day. Like we talked to the project people, and then their boss called us the next day. It's like, tell me what's going on. And it's like, I can't do this, what you're asking for. You know? And in that case, we played, this, this works too, in that case, we played good cop, bad cop, right? Where one person gave the AIGA line, this isn't gonna be the best work, you know, but, you know you're not gonna get exactly what you need. Um, and I was 
there to say, and we won't. You know, so it, it worked out. But that's a touchy piece. But I, again, the AIGA has a really good set of resources around that. And I would say, please, yeah, as another <laughs> development for, please don't do that. Right. The, the reason the AIGA says not to do it, um, a lot of the members of the AIGA are freelancers, and it's very, very unfair. Um, if you have time to do work on spec, unpaid work, and other people don't, and you get pay, you know, you get a job because of it, that's not, that's just not fair, right? It's just, that's why they consider it unethical. Uh, hi, um, thank you very much for not uh, supporting unpaid uh, graphic pictures. This is a major problem here too. Um, I have a question about the support. You said you had to outsource your support unit, um, but isn't the support unit a cornerstone of a long-term relationship with the customer? So how do you solve this problem? Yeah, that's a, it's a fascinating question because our support is in, in Budapest um, and there's a time zone problem, there's a bit of a language problem. All of our support folks do speak fluent English, um, heavily accented English, but, but, but fluent English. Um, we do have long-term project managers, so the point person that they're talking to, one of our people is always on those conversations, um, unless it's a purely technical conversation that they've already built up a relationship. So we're there to bridge, to build the bridge and, and the trust and the confidence and say, look, these are the people we use, this is why we use them, right? And it's interesting, right, because again, in the United States, if we said, oh, right, we have this team in Budapest and they cost half of what we do, that's why we use them, that will offend people, right? It's, it's, outshore, it's offshoring, it's bad, people don't like it. Um, so we actually tell them what I told you, which is, look, here's the thing, you need this, these eight skills, we only have enough work for one person. We hire these people, they give us four people who have that set of skills, right? And they can swap that out. They give us a flexibility that we wouldn't have otherwise. So we can deliver things faster for you as a result. Um, so it, but yeah, typically those conversations happen with, like I showed you Cynthia Philpot. Cynthia ran our support team for a while. Typically it would be Cynthia and the client and one, of, one or two of their developers. So we're always involved there. Um, and, you know, there are times when we use subcontractors right, to supplement our team. And in those cases, you always get Palantir people as well, right? So we're never just, like, handing you off to someone else. You have a session at 12. I have to go. Thank you, everybody. Let me just pack up and get out of the way and we can